the man known to history as Paul von Hindenburg, was born Paul Ludwig Hans Anton von Beneckendorf und von Hindenburg on the 2nd of October 1847 in the city of Posen in the Kingdom of Prussia. The city is now part of Poland and is better known by its Polish name, Poznan. His father, Hans Robert, was a lieutenant in the 18th Infantry Regiment of the Prussian Army, while his mother, Louisa Schwickart, was the daughter of a medical doctor and was born in 1825 in Posen. The couple had four children, of whom Paul was the eldest. Paul had two younger brothers, named Otto and Bernhard, and a younger sister named Ida. According to Hindenburg's memoirs, the family name had been Beneckendorf until 1789, when Paul's great-grandfather added the Hindenburg surname in order to claim his great-uncle's inheritance. Both the Beneckendorfs and the Hindenburgs could trace their ancestry to the 13th century, and both were members of the Prussian aristocratic class known as the Junkers. The Junkers would often serve as officers in the Prussian army, and Paul's ancestors were no different. His paternal grandfather, Otto Ludwig, having fought in the Napoleonic Wars as a medical officer. The Kingdom of Prussia had a proud military tradition and a unique set of political institutions. Its heartland was the electorate of Brandenburg, with its capital in Berlin. From the 14th century, the elector of Brandenburg was one of a small number of imperial princes who could vote for the Holy Roman Emperor, whose empire included most of Germany. From the 15th century, the title of Holy Roman Emperor almost always remained within the House of Habsburg, the rulers of Austria, but the electors retained considerable power and prestige as semi-independent rulers. In the early 17th century, the Brandenburg electors from the Hohenzollern dynasty inherited the Duchy of Prussia from another branch of the family. Although ruled by the same individual, Brandenburg and Prussia were several hundred miles away from each other with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the middle. The state rose to new heights in the 18th century, after Elector Frederick III of Brandenburg assumed the royal title of King Frederick I of Prussia in 1701. His grandson, King Frederick II, nicknamed Frederick the Great, took Prussia to new heights by conquering the rich province of Silesia from Austria in the 1740s. Frederick earned a reputation as one of the greatest military commanders of the age, while his disciplined and well-drilled army was regarded as the best in Europe. During the second half of the 18th century, Frederick and his successors joined Russia and Austria in the partitioning of Poland, which eliminated the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth from the map of Europe. As a result of the partitions, the Kingdom of Prussia acquired the Greater Poland region, renamed West Prussia, with Posen as its capital. In the early 1800s, Emperor Napoleon's desire to expand French influence in Germany faced opposition from the leading Germanic powers, Austria in the south and Prussia in the north. After defeating Austria at the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, in July 1806, Napoleon established the Confederation of the Rhine, a group of Western German states which switched their loyalties to France from the Holy Roman Empire. The following month, the Holy Roman Emperor Francis II preemptively abolished the Holy Roman Empire and retained the title of Emperor of Austria. These events prompted Prussia to declare war on Napoleon in October 1806, but within less than a week, Napoleon shattered Prussia's military reputation by defeating Prussian armies at Jena and Auerstedt and occupying most of the country. In the aftermath of these events, the Treaty of Tilsit in July 1807 created a restored Polish state known as the Duchy of Warsaw, from what had been Prussian Poland, but was now a client state of Napoleonic France. In 1813, following Napoleon's calamitous Russian campaign the previous year, Russian and Prussian armies occupied the duchy, and in 1815, Poland was once again wiped off the European map, and the Kingdom of Prussia resumed its leading role in northern Germany as part of a German confederation led by the Austrian Emperor. The Prussian resistance to Napoleon from 1813 
had been inspired in part by a sense of German nationalism, with liberal Prussian officers seeing themselves as leaders of a German unification movement. However, the conservative Austrian Clemens von Metternich favoured the status quo, and in 1819 he passed the Karlsbad Decrees to dampen nationalist sentiment by banning nationalist organisations and expanding press censorship within the German Confederation. In 1848, the year after Paul von Hindenburg's birth, a wave of liberal and radical revolutions spread across Europe, including in Prussia. In March, the revolutionaries took control of major cities, including Berlin and Posen, where Hindenburg's father was involved in putting down the rebellion. The following April, a delegation of the Prussian National Assembly urged King Frederick William IV of Prussia to become Emperor of United Germany, but the king refused to accept a crown offered to him from the gutter. Following the revolutions of 1848, Paul spent his childhood accompanying his father as he was posted around the country. He would spend his summers at his grandfather Otto's estate of Neudeck, which he considered his real home. At Pinner, near Posen, he was taught French and geography by his father, while receiving lessons in reading, writing and arithmetic from a tutor. While in the city of Glogau, now in northern Poland, Paul spent two years at local primary and secondary schools. In 1859, at the age of 11, he entered the Prussian Cadet Corps at Wallstadt, now the village of Legnitska Pola in southwest Poland. In addition to learning the disciplined and austere ways of a Prussian officer, the young Hindenburg took a particular interest in military history. Although he had a great interest in the great wars of classical antiquity, his preferred historical heroes were Prussians and Germans. The early 1860s would prove a fertile breeding ground for a new generation of German heroes. King Frederick William IV died on the 2nd of January 1861 and was succeeded by his younger brother Wilhelm I. The new king and his prime minister Otto von Bismarck reorganized the Prussian army and sought to achieve German unification through blood and iron. In January 1864, Prussia joined Austria in declaring war on Denmark, laying claim to the disputed duchies of Schleswig, Holstein and Lauenburg in the south of the country. Although the Prussians had been defeated in the First Schleswig War in 1848-51, Wilhelm and Bismarck's reorganization of the Prussian army ensured victory in 1864, and in October, Denmark ceded the three duchies to Austria and Prussia. The 17-year-old Hindenburg was disappointed that he was not old enough to fight in the war, but he would soon have the opportunity to receive his baptism of fire. In 1863, he had been transferred to the cadet school in Berlin, and by 1865, he became a page to Queen Elizabeth, the widow of the late King Frederick William IV. In April 1866, 18-year-old Paul von Hindenburg graduated from his officer training and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the 3rd Regiment of the Foot Guards, stationed at the port city of Danzig, now Gdansk in Poland. No sooner had the young officer arrived in Danzig when the regiment was ordered to Potsdam, near the Prussian capital. As part of Bismarck's plan to achieve a Prussian-led unification of Germany, he provoked war with Austria in the spring of 1866. Hindenburg saw action for the first time leading a group of skirmishers at the Prussian victory at the Battle of Sur on the 28th of June. On the 3rd of July, Hindenburg was part of the Prussian army that faced the Austrians at the Battle of Königgrätz, named after the nearby city which is now Hradec Kralova in the Czech Republic. Although the outnumbered Prussians had been on the defensive at the beginning of the battle, the arrival of Crown Prince Frederick's second army turned the tide decisively in Prussia's favour. During the battle, Hindenburg was hit in the head by a bullet while leading his skirmishers in a charge against an enemy gun battery. Though he lost consciousness, his helmet absorbed most of the impact and he was only lightly grazed, while his men successfully captured several Austrian guns. After returning to Berlin with his men, Hindenburg was awarded the Order of the Red Eagle. 
Prussia's defeat of Austria in 1866 ensured that German unification would be led by Prussia and that the Austrians would be excluded from the new entity. Following the war, Prussia occupied and annexed the Kingdom of Hanover, Austria's ally, and, as part of the 3rd Guards Regiment, Hindenburg was posted to the city of Hanover. Here, he spent the next four years training recruits and preparing for occasional visits by the king. In 1867, Hanover was incorporated into the North German Confederation, led by Prussia. In a reversal of events at the beginning of the century, French Emperor Napoleon III felt threatened by Prussian expansion and declared war on Prussia in July 1870. As Bismarck had anticipated, the unaffiliated German states of Hesse, Bavaria, Baden and Württemberg joined the North German Confederation in the war against France. Hindenburg served as an adjutant to the 1st Battalion of the 3rd Guards, which was assigned to the 9th Army Corps. While he saw action in the German victory at the Battle of St. Privat on the 18th of August, Hindenburg remained in reserve during the climactic Battle of Sedan on the 1st of September, which resulted in the defeat and capture of Napoleon III. A newly constituted French government established the Third Republic, and by mid-September, Hindenburg was among the Prussian troops laying siege to Paris. Taking advantage of the wave of German patriotic sentiment, Bismarck secured the unification of Germany, and King Wilhelm of Prussia was proclaimed Kaiser, or Emperor of Germany, on the 18th of January 1871. As representative of his 3rd Regiment, Hindenburg was present for the ceremony, which took place in the Hall of Mirrors at the former Royal Palace of Versailles, outside Paris. The French capital surrendered at the end of January, and an armistice was signed, pending a definitive peace. In March, the Parisian working class rose up against the government and declared the establishment of the Paris Commune. For the next two months, France was engulfed in a civil war, and Hindenburg witnessed the suppression of the revolution after the Third Republic retook Paris. On the 10th of May 1871, French and German representatives signed the Treaty of Frankfurt to end the Franco-Prussian War. France agreed to cede the provinces of Alsace and northern Lorraine to Germany, which was integrated into the German Empire as the imperial territory of Alsace-Lorraine. The loss of these two provinces would inspire a sense of French resentment against Germany, which would carry on into the 20th century. After marching through Berlin in triumph, Hindenburg and the Third Guards returned to Hanover. In 1873, he enrolled in the War Academy in Berlin, to further his advancement in the Prussian army. In addition to his military studies, Hindenburg socialized frequently with prominent figures in the army and the imperial court, in particular with the emperor's cousin, Prince Alexander of Prussia. After three years at the War Academy, Hindenburg returned briefly to Hanover before being promoted to captain in April 1878 and transferred to the general staff attached to the 2nd Army Corps at Stettin now the Polish city of Szczecin, on the Baltic coast. The following year, the 32-year-old Hindenburg married Gertrude von Sperling, the 19-year-old daughter of the late General Oskar von Sperling, a veteran of the Second Schleswig War, the Austro-Prussian War, and the Franco-Prussian War. The couple would have three children, two daughters named Ermengard and Anne-Maria, and a son named Oskar, who would later join his father in the army. In 1881, Hindenburg was attached to the headquarters of the 1st Division in the East Prussian capital of Königsberg, now part of the Russian exclave of Kaliningrad. His commanding officer was General Julius von Verdi von Vernois, a well-known military writer who, in addition to his service in the recent wars against the Austrians and French, had been attached to the Russian army during its suppression of a rebellion in Poland in 1863 giving him valuable insight into Prussia and Germany's eastern border. After three years at Königsberg, Hindenburg took command of a company of the 58th Infantry Regiment stationed near Posen. The men of the company were almost exclusively ethnic Poles, and Hindenburg struggled to communicate with them, but he nevertheless regarded them as hard-working and loyal soldiers. 
In 1885, he was promoted to the rank of Major and returned to the General Staff, where he worked under Colonel Alfred von Schlieffen, who would later serve as Chief of the General Staff at the beginning of the 20th century. In addition to being attached to the 8th Army Corps, Hindenburg taught tactics at the War Academy for five years. During military exercises in 1886, Hindenburg met Prince Wilhelm, who was at that time second in line to the imperial throne as the grandson of Emperor Wilhelm I. When the old emperor died on the 9th of March 1888, he was succeeded by his son Frederick III. The new emperor was already terminally ill with throat cancer, and upon his death on the 15th of June, his son assumed the throne as Kaiser Wilhelm II. Wilhelm soon fell out with Bismarck and dismissed him from his position as Chancellor in 1890. In the two decades after German unification, Bismarck sought to maintain peace in Europe and sought to remain on good terms with France to the west and Russia to the east. After removing Bismarck, Wilhelm II pursued a more assertive foreign policy, and in 1894, a defensive alliance was signed between France and Russia in response to the German threat. As the grandson of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, Wilhelm was inspired by the British Royal Navy to build a large fleet of his own. In 1897, the Kaiser initiated a massive expansion of the German fleet, supervised by Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, which he hoped to use to threaten the British into supporting his colonial ambitions in Africa and Asia. The British responded to this threat by signing Entente to resolve existing diplomatic tensions with France in 1904 and Russia in 1907. During this period, Hindenburg continued to rise up the ranks of the Imperial German Army. In 1889, he was transferred to the War Ministry, working under War Minister General Verdi, his former divisional commander. After writing the regulations concerning field engineering and the use of heavy artillery, in 1893, he was promoted to the position of colonel and took command of the 91st Infantry Regiment stationed in Oldenburg in northwestern Germany. Three years later, he became chief of staff of the 8th Army Corps at Koblenz on the Rhineland in western Germany, working closely alongside his commanding officer, the Kaiser's uncle, Grand Duke Frederick I of Baden. In 1897, Hindenburg was promoted to Major General and upon promotion to Lieutenant General in 1900, he took command of the 26th Infantry Division at Karlsruhe in southwestern Germany for five years. In 1905, he became a full general of the infantry and was given command of the 4th Army Corps in Magdeburg. By 1911, Hindenburg was 64 years old and had risen to great heights in the German army. He had played his part in the wars of German unification against Austria in 1866 and France in 1870-71, but saw no further action over the next four decades as Germany remained at peace. With few prospects for further promotion from his corps command, Hindenburg decided to make way for younger men and retired to Hanover. Although Hindenburg believed that there was no prospect of war, Kaiser Wilhelm's actions on the international stage further alienated Britain, France and Russia. By the first decade of the 20th century, the British and Germans were engaged in a naval arms race focused on building dreadnought battleships armed with heavy guns. Wilhelm's support for the Sultan of Morocco in 1905 threatened French interests in the North African country, while the appointment of German officer Liman von Sanders in 1913 as commander of the garrison of Constantinople in Turkey was regarded with suspicion by Russia, which feared that the Germans would force the Turks to close the Straits of Constantinople to Russia's Black Sea trade. Russia was also opposed to German support for its central European ally, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was Russia's rival in the Balkan Peninsula in Southeast Europe. On the 28th of June 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austrian throne, was assassinated in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo by the Bosnian Serb nationalist Gavrilo Princip. The event set off a chain reaction of alliance obligations as the Austrians declared war on Serbia on the 28th of July, 
Russia mobilized to support its Serbian ally and Germany declared war on Russia to support Austria on the 1st of August. According to the German war plan drawn up by the late Alfred von Schlieffen and later amended by his successor, Helmut von Moltke, in order to avoid a two-front war against France and Russia, the bulk of the German army would bypass the French fortresses on the eastern border by marching through neutral Belgium to invade northern France and surround Paris before the Russian army could complete its mobilization. Following the German invasion of Belgium on the 4th of August, Britain joined the war alongside France and Russia, marking the beginning of the First World War, known as the Great War at the time. The German offensive in Belgium and northern France on the Western Front bogged down after determined resistance from French troops supported by the British Expeditionary Force. News on the Eastern Front was not much better, as the Russian 1st and 2nd Armies swept into East Prussia, defeating the outnumbered German 8th Army at the Battle of Gumbinnen on the 20th of August, when a panicked 8th Army commander, Maximilian von Prittwitz, suggested abandoning East Prussia, which would place Berlin at risk, Moltke recalled Hindenburg from retirement and appointed him commander of the 8th Army. In retirement, Hindenburg had been nostalgic about military life and relished the opportunity to put on his uniform in the service of the Kaiser once again. His chief of staff was Major General Erich Ludendorff, a talented 49-year-old staff officer who had just led the successful assault on the Belgian fortress of Liège. On the 23rd of August, Hindenburg and Ludendorff arrived at the headquarters of the 8th Army at Marienburg, present-day Malbork in northern Poland. While Hindenburg displayed a calm demeanor and preferred to make decisions slowly, Ludendorff was more impulsive and favored bold and ambitious plans. Despite the differences in their personalities, Hindenburg would later describe his military partnership with Ludendorff as a happy marriage, and he allowed Ludendorff to exhibit his enterprising genius as a strategist, while providing moral support during his more unstable periods. Hindenburg and Ludendorff abandoned Prittwitz's plans to retreat and instead concentrated their forces in the south to confront the second Russian army under General Alexander Samsonov, leaving a light screening force against the first Russian army under General Paul von Rennenkampf. Hindenburg and Ludendorff plotted the annihilation of Samsonov's army, advancing on the enemy with a thin center and concentrating the army's strength on its flanks. Although they feared that Rennenkampf would come to Samsonov's aid, one Lieutenant Colonel Max Hoffman, who had been attached to the Japanese army during the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905, informed his superiors that the two Russian generals had been involved in a feud during the earlier conflict and might not cooperate effectively with each other. On the 26th of August, the battle began on a 60-mile front near the city of Allenstein, now Olsztyn in Poland. While Hindenburg's center fell back as planned against the Russians, a powerful flank attack led by the dynamic General Hermann von Francois crashed into Samsonov's left on the 27th of August. The following morning, after receiving reports that Renenkamp was advancing on the German rear, Ludendorff advised calling off the attack, but Hindenburg encouraged him to stick to the plan. By the end of the 28th, the Second Army was encircled, and Hindenburg employed his reserves to resist any Russian attempts to break out of the encirclement. On the evening of the 30th, General Samsonov disappeared into the woods and killed himself out of despair, while his Second Army was completely destroyed with more than 50,000 killed and wounded, and 90,000 prisoners being taken. Following the German victory, Hindenburg named the battle after nearby Tannenberg, where over 500 years earlier the Teutonic Knights, the predecessors to the Prussian and German states, had been defeated by a Polish-Lithuanian alliance. The name of Tannenberg was thus transformed from one of humiliation and defeat to one of German victory. After learning of the scale of Samsonov's defeat, Renenkampf decided to stop his advance and assume the defensive. Hindenburg appreciated the fact that the Russians would soon reinforce their armies in East Prussia and regain the initiative, 
and rapidly redeployed his forces using the German railway network to confront the Russian First Army. In early September, Hindenburg advanced against Renenkampf around the Masurian Lakes east of the battlefield of Tannenberg. Despite being reinforced by the Russian 10th Army, Renenkampf's counterattacks were unsuccessful and he was forced to withdraw eastwards. Although he avoided Samsonov's fate of encirclement, Renenkampf was considerably weakened and suffered 100,000 casualties by the end of the battle on the 18th of September. Within the space of a month, the relatively unknown General Hindenburg became internationally famous for his lopsided victories at Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes. Hindenburg and Ludendorff's stunning victories stood in stark contrast to the failure of the German army to make further progress in France and Belgium, where the two opposing armies began to entrench themselves for a prolonged static war. In September, Kaiser Wilhelm dismissed Moltke as chief of staff and replaced him with Erich von Falkenheim. On the 1st of November 1914, Hindenburg was promoted to field marshal and named commander of the Eastern Front, incorporating his 8th Army and the newly formed 9th Army. The Russian army had been more successful in its offensive against the Austrians in the region of Galicia, now divided between Poland and Ukraine. A second Russian invasion of East Prussia during the autumn was beaten back by Hindenburg, and on the 6th of December, the Germans captured the Polish city of Łódź, further enhancing Hindenburg's reputation as a successful commander. In February 1915, Hindenburg surprised the Russians by launching an attack during a snowstorm at the Second Battle of the Masurian Lakes and once again inflicted more than 100,000 casualties on the enemy. While Hindenburg believed that it was possible to win the war by defeating Russia in the east, Falkenhayn continued to insist that the path to victory lay on the Western Front. The Chief of Staff aimed to maintain his authority over Hindenburg by reassigning Ludendorff to Galicia, but restored the partnership after both men threatened to resign and the Kaiser intervened on their behalf. Falkenhayn was briefly persuaded to move the general headquarters to the Eastern Front and ordered a new offensive against the Russians in Galicia. In May, a new army group of German and Austrian troops, commanded by August von Mackensen, launched an offensive that captured the cities of Gorlitza and Tarno in southeastern Poland. Hindenburg's 9th and 10th armies played a supporting role in the north on the Baltic coast. During the summer, the Russians evacuated Galicia and abandoned Poland and Lithuania while Tsar Nicholas II assumed personal command of the Russian army. By October, Hindenburg was able to move his headquarters to the Lithuanian city of Kaunas. While Hindenburg ordered the construction of fortresses to protect the conquered territories from Russian counterattack, Ludendorff took charge of the civil government and directed its economic resources to support the German war effort. On the 4th of June 1916, Four Russian armies under the command of General Alexei Brusilov launched a powerful offensive in eastern Galicia, which broke through the Austrian defences and took over 200,000 Austrian prisoners within 10 days. As Brusilov continued his advance, Ludendorff desperately pleaded for reinforcements from the general headquarters. In the meantime, Hindenburg managed to strengthen his defences and stood firm against Russian attacks in the Baltic region to the north. On the 27th of July, Hindenburg took command of part of the weakened Austrian army on the Eastern Front, and by the beginning of August, the Brusilov offensive ground to a halt. In order to shore up the Eastern Front, Falkenhayn had been forced to divert reinforcements from the Western Front, weakening the German attack on the French fortress at Verdun. German prospects in the war were further undermined when Romania joined the Entente powers on the 27th of August 1916. These setbacks led to Falkenhayn's dismissal as Chief of Staff, and on the 29th of August, Hindenburg became Chief of Staff, with Ludendorff as Quartermaster General, though in practical terms both men shared the supreme command. Hindenburg's appointment was supported by Chancellor Theobald von bettmann holweck but as the most popular individuals in the empire, Hindenburg and Ludendorff effectively controlled the German government 
and undermined Bettmann Holweg's authority. Kaiser Wilhelm's popularity was also in decline, and he took less interest in the details of the war, which further concentrated power in Hindenburg's hands. Hindenburg had also been placed in supreme command of the armies of the whole Central Power Alliance, including Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria and the Turkish Ottoman Empire, placing some six million troops in total at his disposal. After taking command, Hindenburg reorganized the German defenses on the Western Front by building a second defensive line, which he called the Siegfried Line, also known as the Hindenburg Line. In late 1916, French commanders Philippe Pétain and Robert Nivelle launched a series of attacks at Verdun, which recaptured all the ground lost to Germany during the year. Hindenburg demanded a doubling of industrial production to support a major counter-offensive in 1917, but the German economy was unable to replace the munitions expended at Verdun. In February, Hindenburg ordered the gradual withdrawal of German troops to the Hindenburg Line. While the German economy was suffering from shortages due to the blockade of German ports by the British Navy, the British and French were receiving supplies across the Atlantic from the United States of America. The German Navy had previously attempted to disrupt the flow of supplies by launching submarine attacks, but the sinking of the passenger liner Lusitania in 1915 with the loss of over a thousand lives prompted a protest from the United States which forced Germany to limit its submarine activity in the Atlantic Ocean. On the 9th of January 1917, Hindenburg and Ludendorff overcame the objections of Bettmann Holwig and successfully persuaded the Kaiser to adopt a policy of unrestricted submarine warfare to weaken British control of the seas and to cut off American aid to Britain and France. As Chancellor Bettmann Holweg had warned would happen, the decision led the United States to declare war on Germany in early April 1917, and by July, General John J. Pershing and a group of officers had arrived in France, ahead of an American expeditionary force. Though the German military command hoped that the submarines would prevent American troops from landing in Europe in large numbers, the British and American navies were able to form convoys to escort men and supplies across the Atlantic Ocean. The United States Army had never fought on European soil before, and it would take time for Pershing to recruit and train significant numbers of men for action on the Western Front. Hindenburg and Ludendorff believed that the best chance of victory was to gather the resources for an offensive, to defeat the British and French on the Western Front before the Americans landed in Europe in force. Germany's prospects improved in March 1917, when Tsar Nicholas of Russia abdicated the throne following the revolutionary demonstrations on the streets of Petrograd, the Russian imperial capital. Although the new Russian provisional government continued to fight on the Eastern Front, the breakdown of discipline in the Russian army undermined its capabilities and allowed Hindenburg to transfer his stronger units from the East to the Western Front. On the 1st of July, Russian War Minister Alexander Kerensky launched an offensive into Galicia, prompting Hindenburg to launch a counter-offensive to break the Russian lines on the 18th of July. In the aftermath of the failed Kerensky offensive, the Bolshevik party gained popularity in Petrograd as the only major political party calling for an immediate end to the war. In November, Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin overthrew the provisional government and seized power in Petrograd on behalf of the Soviets, the workers and soldiers' councils around the country, which decentralized the authority of managers in factories and officers on the front lines. An armistice was agreed in December 1917, and peace negotiations were held at Brest-Litovsk in modern-day Belarus. In July 1917, the German parliament, the Reichstag, debated a proposal for a peaceful end to the war without annexations or indemnities along the lines of peace initiatives advanced by US President Woodrow Wilson. Hindenburg and Ludendorff rushed back to Berlin to prevent the passage of such a resolution but were instructed by the Kaiser to return to headquarters. The two generals threatened to resign if Bettmann Holweg were not removed from office, and though the Kaiser rejected the ultimatum, 
the Chancellor decided to resign voluntarily. The new Chancellor, a businessman and civil servant named Georg Michaelis, failed to prevent Hindenburg and Ludendorff from establishing an effective military dictatorship over Germany. Hindenburg continued to support the expansion of German power and urged the annexation of all territories conquered from Russia during the negotiations at Brest-Litovsk. When Soviet Foreign Minister Leon Trotsky refused the terms, Hindenburg ended the armistice and ordered German troops to occupy the Baltic states, Belarus and Ukraine. With Petrograd at risk of falling to the Germans, Trotsky signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk on the 3rd of March, giving up more than 300,000 square miles of Russian territory. The occupation of this vast territory required substantial German manpower, which would have been more effectively deployed on the Western Front. In January 1918, faced with increasing shortages, half a million German workers went on strike in Berlin, demanding an end to the war. Unlike in Russia the previous year, Hindenburg suppressed the strikes with ruthless efficiency, but he knew that the economy could not sustain the war effort much longer. On the 21st of March 1918, Hindenburg and Ludendorff launched Operation Michael, the main thrust of the spring offensive intended to split the British and French armies near Saint-Quentin, drive the British towards the sea and force France to sue for peace. By the 25th of March, the Germans had almost entirely destroyed the British Fifth Army, commanded by General Hubert Goff, and the failure of the British and French commands to cooperate with each other led to the appointment of French General Ferdinand Foch as Allied Commander-in-Chief. Following these initial German successes, Kaiser Wilhelm awarded Hindenburg and Ludendorff the Grand Cross of the Iron Cross, but his optimism soon proved misplaced, as the German attack foundered near the River Somme, the site of heavy fighting in 1916. The British strengthened their defences at Amiens and Arras, and on the 5th of April, Ludendorff called off Operation Michael. Further German offences in the spring were beaten back with heavy losses on both sides but by the summer around 10,000 Americans were arriving in France each day, giving the Allies a numerical superiority on the Western Front. Before Hindenburg could launch any further attacks, Foch launched a counteroffensive to target the Marne salient, a German bulge into the Allied lines around the River Arne. After the defeat of the French and Americans at Soissons on the 22nd of July, Hindenburg went on the defensive while Foch coordinated a series of offences along the entire front. On the 8th of August, British forces broke through German lines east of Amiens, causing Ludendorff to suffer a mental breakdown. Hindenburg stood by his comrade-in-arms and resisted calls to replace him as quartermaster general. Hindenburg remained confident of victory as Ludendorff avoided informing him of the desperate situation facing the army. But on the 28th of September, Hindenburg's illusions of ultimate victory were finally shattered when Ludendorff informed him of the true situation on the ground. The following day, the two men urged the Kaiser to seek an end to the war and rally popular support by giving up his absolute powers and establishing a parliamentary government. On the 3rd of October, Prince Maximilian of Baden was appointed Chancellor to lead peace negotiations with the Allies. Hindenburg urged the new Chancellor to act quickly, and the Prince made contact with President Wilson of the United States the following day. Though Wilson was inclined to be lenient towards Germany, the sinking of a passenger ship, Leinster, on the 12th of October, with the loss of 200 British and American lives, caused Wilson to harden his terms and insist on the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm. Wilson also insisted that Germany give up its conquests in the East, and Hindenburg and Ludendorff changed course and once again urged the continuation of the war and a new offensive. But the German defences along the Hindenburg Line were crumbling, and the domestic economic situation was deteriorating. On the 24th of October, Hindenburg and Ludendorff issued instructions for the army to continue fighting, prompting a rebuke from the Kaiser for not consulting the Chancellor first. On the 26th, Ludendorff resigned, but Hindenburg retained his command ending their four-year partnership. On the 3rd of November, after receiving orders to sail out and attack the British fleet, German sailors at the port of Kiel 
took matters into their own hands and mutinied, demanding the Kaiser's abdication. The uprising spread throughout the country, and in Munich a Soviet Republic was established along the lines of the Bolshevik system. Wilhelm resisted calls for his abdication and instead hoped to use the army to suppress the uprisings at home, but on the 9th of November Hindenburg informed him that the army would not support him. Wilhelm finally agreed to abdicate as German Emperor and retain the title of King of Prussia, but by the afternoon a German Republic was proclaimed in Berlin and Prince Max von Baden resigned as Chancellor in favour of Friedrich Ebert, the leader of the moderate Social Democratic Party. Fearing that the Kaiser might be captured by radical revolutionaries and suffer the same fate as Tsar Nicholas, who had been executed alongside his family in July 1918, Hindenburg advised Wilhelm to flee to the Netherlands. The Kaiser reluctantly accepted the advice and spent the rest of his life in exile at a manor house in the town of Dorn. Hindenburg retained command of the army and pledged loyalty to Ebert's government on the condition that it took action against radical communist revolutionaries. After the armistice was signed on the 11th of November 1918, Hindenburg supervised the withdrawal of German troops from the Western Front. In January 1919, Communist Party leaders Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg led the Spartacist uprising in Berlin against the new Social Democratic government. Rather than using the men of the army to suppress the uprising, Hindenburg provided arms to the Freikorps, the independent paramilitary groups which suppressed the uprising and executed its leaders on the government's behalf. In the meantime, the leaders of Britain, France and the United States were in the process of determining the shape of the post-war world at the Paris Peace Conference. In May 1919, the Allies sent Ebert preliminary peace terms. Germany would give up Alsace-Lorraine to France, while Hindenburg's native city of Posen would become part of a restored Polish state. The German army would be limited to 100,000 men, its navy to 15,000 men, and it would not be allowed an air force. The preliminary terms were unanimously opposed by all German political parties. Ebert knew that the German military was in no condition to continue the war, and when Hindenburg reluctantly confirmed this was the case, the Treaty of Versailles was signed on the 28th of June 1919, in the Hall of Mirrors, the same room where the German Empire was proclaimed 48 years earlier. Faced with the new limits on the size of the German army, Hindenburg duly resigned his command and retired for the second time to Hanover. As he began his second retirement, he was a few months shy of his 72nd birthday. Within the space of five eventful years, Hindenburg was transformed from an obscure retired general to one of the most successful military commanders in German history, winning international fame for his victories at Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes, as well as other German successes on the Eastern Front. Despite Hindenburg's failure to prevent Germany's defeat in the First World War as Chief of Staff, he retained widespread popularity throughout the country. When he arrived in Hanover in early July, he received a hero's welcome and was gifted a magnificent villa by the city's authorities, where he lived for the next five years. In August, a constitutional assembly that met in the city of Weimar promulgated a constitution establishing the state known to history as the Weimar Republic. Friedrich Ebert had been elected provisional president in February and was confirmed in office in August. The Weimar Constitution guaranteed the civil liberties of the people and created a parliamentary democracy, giving men and women over the age of 20 the right to vote for their representatives in the Reichstag, with seats allocated according to proportional representation. While Hindenburg was opposed to democracy, he largely avoided politics and spent his time hunting and collecting paintings. Nevertheless, he made a major contribution to post-war discourse in Germany in November 1919, when he appeared alongside Ludendorff before a government inquiry into the conduct of the First World War. The two men argued that the German army had not been defeated on the field of war, but had been stabbed in the back by socialist politicians at home. The accusation was echoed in Hindenburg's autobiography, Aus meinem Leben, or Out of My Life, published in 1920, 
in which he defended his leadership during the First World War. The following year, Hindenburg's wife Gertrude died of cancer at the age of 61. Though both Hindenburg and Ludendorff knew that the German army had been defeated militarily, by spreading the stab-in-the-back myth, they undermined the new Republican government and encouraged right-wing officers in their efforts to overthrow the Weimar Republic. In March 1920, the Freikorps seized control of Berlin and proclaimed the nationalist civil servant Wolfgang Kapp as the new president. When the German army refused to suppress the Kapp Putsch, Ebert moved his government to Stuttgart and rallied the workers of Berlin who went on strike, and within days the Putsch was defeated. The failure of the Kapp Putsch did not prevent right-wing extremists from resorting to political violence against the politicians they held responsible for the German defeat. In August 1921, they assassinated Matthias Erzberger, the leader of the moderate Centre Party who led the German delegation that signed the Treaty of Versailles. The following June, Foreign Minister Walter Rathenau was murdered after signing the Treaty of Rapallo in April which aimed to normalize relations with Soviet Russia. Burdened by economic collapse during the war and the punitive reparations imposed by the Allies, the Weimar Republic defaulted on their reparations in December 1922, leading to the French occupation of the German industrial area of the Ruhr Valley. The Weimar government printed money to pay government officials, resulting in a hyperinflationary spiral to the extent that by the end of 1923, a newspaper cost several billion German marks. In November, Adolf Hitler, leader of the right-wing National Socialist German Workers' Party, nicknamed Nazis by its opponents, led an unsuccessful putsch in Bavaria from a Munich beer hall. While Hindenburg remained unaffiliated to any political party, Ludendorff joined Hitler's beer hall putsch and was put on trial in early 1924, but was acquitted. Hitler was imprisoned and spent his time writing Mein Kampf, a book that blamed Germany's political ills on the Jewish people, whom he believed were behind a global conspiracy to take over the world, both through the international financial system and support for communist parties in Europe. Hitler also wrote about the need to restore German prestige after the First World War and promoted the expansion of Germany to the east at the expense of the Slavs in Poland Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union. In 1924, the political situation in Germany stabilized after Foreign Minister Gustav Stresemann negotiated a loan from the United States, brokered by American banker Charles Dawes, which enabled the resumption of reparation payments, the end of the occupation of the Ruhr, and the creation of a new German currency backed by the US dollar. The recovery of the German economy and democracy owed much to President Ebert, who died on the 28th of February 1925. A presidential election was held at the end of March, but none of the candidates received a majority, prompting a runoff election a month later. This time, three moderate parties on the left supported Wilhelm Marx of the Center Party, though the Communists continued to run their own candidate. The conservative and nationalist right struggled to find a candidate until Hindenburg reluctantly agreed to put forward his candidacy, motivated by a sense of duty. During the campaign, Hindenburg stressed national unity and agreed to defend the Weimar Constitution as president, despite his own reservations. During the second round on the 26th of April, Hindenburg received 14.7 million votes, Marx 13.8 million votes, and the Communist Party leader Ernst Tellmann, 1.9 million votes. A majority was not required in the second round, and Hindenburg was sworn in as President of the German Republic on the 12th of May. Hindenburg moved into the presidential palace with his son Oskar and his family. Oskar had fought in the First World War as a captain and served as his father's military liaison officer after the war. He would play a major role during his father's presidency as an advisor and the man who controlled access to the president. The elder Hindenburg also relied on the advice of Dr. Otto Meissner, who had stayed on as head of the presidential staff. President Hindenburg enjoyed a close working relationship with Foreign Minister Stresemann and supported his policy of repairing and improving relations with Germany's former enemies. In October 1925, 
Stresemann negotiated the Locarno Treaties, which renounced German claims on territories lost to France and Belgium as part of the Versailles Settlement. In return, British troops withdrew their occupation forces from the Rhineland in 1926, and Germany was allowed to join the League of Nations, the international organization established at Versailles as a forum to promote global peace and resolve diplomatic disagreements amicably. The Locarno Agreement was followed up with a treaty with the Soviet Union in April 1926 to reaffirm the Treaty of Rapallo. The international community regarded Hindenburg favorably as a patriot and elder statesman who desired to improve Germany's reputation. Hindenburg's support for Stresemann's policies infuriated his conservative power base, but he bolstered his support among conservatives and monarchists by opposing the expropriation of the former imperial family's property, encouraging a boycott of the referendum on the issue and causing the proposals to be rejected. In 1927, Chancellor Wilhelm Marx's government passed laws to limit working hours to eight hours a day and to establish an unemployment insurance system. The German economic recovery after 1925 increased popular support for the Weimar Republic and the moderate parties in government, and in the parliamentary elections of 1928, the nationalists performed poorly, and a new government was established with Social Democrat Hermann Müller as Chancellor. Müller worked well with both Stresemann and Hindenburg, who later described him as the best chancellor he ever worked with. Despite American financial support, the German economy continued to struggle to cope with the burden of war reparations. Stresemann's diplomacy encouraged the Americans to put forward the Young Plan, named after businessman Owen Young, which reduced reparation payments by 20% and lowered annual payments by extending the term to 1988 in addition to the French withdrawal from the Rhineland in 1930. While Hindenburg welcomed the agreement, especially the prospect of the end of Allied occupation in Germany, the Conservatives and Nationalists opposed the arrangement and preferred to do away with reparations altogether. Stresemann's efforts to promote the Young Plan in the Reichstag took its toll on his health, and he died on the 3rd of October 1929. Within a few weeks, a stock market crash in New York triggered the Great Depression in the United States. The Great Depression had a devastating impact on the global economy as a whole, and to make matters worse for Germany, Stresemann's efforts to revive the nation's economy were dependent on American credit, which dried up following the Wall Street crash. As a result, German unemployment skyrocketed to 4 million in 1930. When the powerless Hermann Müller resigned as Chancellor at the end of March, Hindenburg was persuaded by Kurt von Schleicher, a military officer and a friend of his son Oskar, to appoint the economist Heinrich Brüning of the Centre Party as the new Chancellor. Brüning responded to the economic crisis by introducing a programme of austerity, which combined tax increases with government spending cuts. When the proposals were rejected by the Reichstag, Schleicher persuaded Hindenburg to invoke Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution, which gave the President emergency powers to enact laws without approval from the Reichstag. Though intended for military emergencies, Brüning used the procedure to pass his budget. In response, the Social Democrats joined the Communists and the right-wing German National People's Party in the Reichstag to exercise their constitutional right to vote down emergency decrees within 60 days. The Chancellor asked Hindenburg to call a new Reichstag election, which was held in September 1930. While the Social Democrats remained the largest party, Adolf Hitler's Nazis came second, with 107 seats, having only won 12 at the previous election. The Communists came third and increased their representation from 54 to 77 seats. Brüning continued to rely on Article 48 to pass his austerity measures, prompting the Nazis and the German nationals to walk out of the Reichstag. Hindenburg's seven-year presidential term was coming to an end in early 1932, and he was persuaded by his closest advisers to run for re-election. His decision to run might also have been influenced by his desire to prevent the election of Hitler whom he met for the first time in October 1931 and dismissed as the Austrian corporal. 
Hindenburg also felt threatened by the Nazis' desire for the state to assume control of large landed estates. After failing to win a majority in the first round, Hindenburg approached the second round in April 1932, with the support of the center and the moderate left, while the right supported Hitler's candidacy. Though Hindenburg won more than 19 million votes to Hitler's 13 million, he was disappointed that he was opposed by his traditional allies, the conservatives and nationalists. Hindenburg had been increasingly irritated by Brüning's reliance on Article 48 and could not understand the rationale behind his economic policy, and in May 1932 informed his chancellor that he could no longer count on Article 48. Brüning resigned on the 30th of May and was replaced the following day by Franz von Papen, a friend of Schleicher's from the right wing of the Centre Party. Hindenburg and Papen soon moved against the left by removing the Social Democrat government in the state of Prussia on the 20th of July. Papen had even less support in the Reichstag and was forced to call a new election for the end of July. Although the French, British and Americans had agreed at the Lausanne Conference to extend a moratorium on reparation payments, this was not enough to prevent the further radicalization of German politics. Hitler's Nazis won 37% of the vote and increased their representation to 230 seats, almost a hundred more than the Social Democrats in second place. Following the election, Hitler demanded the chancellorship, but Hindenburg was only prepared to make him vice-chancellor, telling the Nazi leader that his duty to his country prevented him from appointing a man who intended to become a dictator. Papen limped on as chancellor, using Article 48 before a further election was held in November. The Nazis lost 4% of the vote and over 30 seats, but the election did not bring any further clarity to the political situation. In December, Hindenburg turned to Schleicher to form a new government, but the latter's efforts to persuade prominent Nazis to join his cabinet against Hitler's wishes were unsuccessful. Papen had fallen out with Schleicher and in January 1933 presented a plan to Hindenburg to remove his erstwhile friend from office while breaking the political deadlock. Under Papen's proposals, Hitler would be invited to serve as Chancellor, with Papen as Vice-Chancellor to keep an eye on Hitler by attending all the meetings between the President and Chancellor. Although he continued to express reservations in private, Hindenburg agreed to appoint Hitler Chancellor on the 30th of January 1933. But it soon became clear that Hindenburg and Papen were mistaken in their belief that they could control Hitler. On the 4th of February, Hindenburg used Article 48 to issue a decree placing limits on the freedom of the press by prohibiting criticism of leading government officials. As Interior Minister of Prussia, Hitler's right-hand man, Hermann Göring, ordered the Prussian police to arrest political opponents for criticizing the government. Göring infiltrated the Prussian police with the Sturmabteilung, or SA, Nazi stormtroopers also nicknamed the Brown Shirts. On the night of the 27th of February, a fire destroyed the Reichstag building. The following day, Hitler blamed a Dutch communist for the fire and persuaded Hindenburg to issue the Reichstag fire decree, which suspended civil liberties and enabled Hitler to crack down on the communists. It is likely that Nazis were responsible for the Reichstag fire, using it to allow Hitler to consolidate his power. Hindenburg was no fan of the socialists and remained deaf to the pleas by social democratic leaders about the brutality of the crackdown on political opposition. New elections were held on the 5th of March 1933, after which the Nazis won 44% of the vote and 288 seats. At the opening of the new Reichstag in Potsdam on the 21st of March, Hitler praised Hindenburg for helping him restore Germany's national honor. On the 23rd of March, the Nazis forced the Reichstag deputies to pass the Enabling Act, which transferred legislative power to Hitler as Chancellor and served as the final nail in the coffin of the Weimar Republic. As Hindenburg remained the only obstacle between Hitler and absolute power and retained the authority to sack his Chancellor, Hitler treated the old war hero with respect. Hindenburg approved of Hitler's plans to promote German nationalism and reverse the humiliations of the First World War, while Hitler promised the president that he would restore the monarchy. 
As part of this new understanding, Papen was no longer required to be present at meetings between the president and chancellor. With Hitler driving the political agenda in Berlin, Hindenburg retreated to his childhood home of Neudeck. The enabling act gave Hitler free reign to continue his persecution of political opponents and ethnic minorities, in particular the Jewish population. In April, Jews were prevented from working for the government, though Hindenburg managed to secure an exception for war veterans. By July 1933, the Nazis banned all other political parties, establishing a one-party state. By 1934, Hindenburg was concerned about the SA's political violence, and in June, he authorized Papen to give a speech at the University of Marburg calling for the restoration of civil liberties and an end to the SA's terror campaign, while the Minister of War, Werner von Blomberg, informed Hitler that Hindenburg threatened to declare martial law if he did not take action against the SA. Keen to retain Hindenburg's support, and having his own doubts about the loyalty of the SA leadership, on the 30th of June, Hitler launched a purge of the SA in the so-called Night of the Long Knives. Hitler also used the opportunity to move against Papen's conservative allies. The former Chancellor Schleicher was among the hundreds killed in a three-day bloodbath. A telegram was issued in Hindenburg's name thanking Hitler for saving Germany though Goering later admitted that it had been written by the Nazis and had not been seen by the president. By this time, Hindenburg was already seriously ill, and he died of lung cancer at Neudeck on the 2nd of August 1934, at the age of 86. Four days later, he was buried in a grand ceremony at the Tannenberg Memorial on the site of his famous victory 20 years earlier. Immediately after Hindenburg's death, Hitler abolished the presidency and assumed the title of Führer, or leader. Over the following decade, Hitler and the Nazi regime would be responsible for the persecution of millions of ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities in Germany. After annexing Austria in March 1938 and invading Czechoslovakia in March 1939, Hitler's invasion of Poland in August 1939 led to the Second World War during which more than 70 million soldiers and civilians died, including 6 million Jews murdered in the gas chambers of the Holocaust. The war in Europe ended in May 1945 with the occupation of Germany by Soviet troops from the East and British, French and American forces from the West. In 1944, with the Soviets rapidly advancing on East Prussia, Oskar von Hindenburg removed his parents' remains from the Tannenberg Memorial which was subsequently destroyed by the Soviets. After the war, the remains of Hindenburg and his wife were discovered by the US Army in a salt mine and reburied at St. Elizabeth's Church in Marburg, where they remain to this day. Paul von Hindenburg leaves behind a complex legacy as one of the most successful military commanders of the First World War and the man who enabled Hitler's rise to power. Hindenburg had begun his military career in the Prussian army, fighting in the wars of German unification, but most of his time in uniform was relatively uneventful. It was only after the initial German setbacks on the Eastern Front in the First World War that led to his recall in August 1914 and his victories at Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes. Though Ludendorff was blessed with superior military genius, Hindenburg received the lion's share of the credit fueling a cult of personality that would make him the most popular general in the German army, indeed more popular than the Kaiser himself. By the final year of the war, Hindenburg and Ludendorff were effectively leading a military dictatorship, but they were unwilling to seek a diplomatic solution and unable to secure victory on the battlefield. Though he was prepared to support the Weimar Republic against the threat of communist revolution, he fatally undermined the Republican government by fueling the stab-in-the-back myth. After succeeding Ebert as president in 1925, Hindenburg worked effectively with Stresemann to restore Germany's international position, but following Stresemann's death and the Wall Street crash, he was increasingly forced to rule by decree. The political deadlock eventually led him to appoint Hitler as chancellor, paving the way for the horrors of the Nazi regime. What do you think of Paul von Hindenburg? 
Was he a German patriot who saved Germany from disaster on the Eastern Front during the First World War? Or was he a militarist and a reactionary nationalist who was responsible for Hitler's rise to power and who failed to speak out against his brutal methods until it was too late? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.